with the Butt Kicker Gamer 2, what you see and what you hear is what you feel. Butt Kicker. The future is feeling. To be the best, one must beat the best. Ovals, road courses, the streets of iconic cities, race after race, the top sim racing IndyCar stars will battle it out. In sim racing, it doesn't get any better than this. This is their battleground for the checkered flag, for the glory, for the right to say they are the best. Cars and stars of the Lionheart IndyCar Series, presented by Butt Kicker, are ready to race. Two weeks ago, the Lionheart Racing Series, powered by HyperX, visited the virtual Homestead Miami for its traditional season opener. And in his quest to claim a fourth consecutive Lionheart IndyCar Championship, Adam Blocker took his first ever victory in the Sunshine State. We now travel toward the entertainment capital of the world and our first street course of the season for the HyperX Grand Prix of Long Beach. Hello and welcome to RaceBot TV and coverage of the Lionheart Racing Series powered by HyperX, makers of premier gaming gear like the legendary ultra comfortable Cloud line of gaming headsets. Whatever you play, however you play, HyperX knows we are all gamers. For more information on HyperX products, visit HyperXGaming.com and don't forget to use promo code LIONHEART15, that's L-I-O-N-H-R-T-1-5, for 15% off all orders. My name is Arjuna Kenkipati, and I'm joined by Justin Prince for today's coverage, with Tyler Maxson down in the production booth, controlling all of the action. TV cameras are designed by Tyler himself, and you can follow along with live timing and scoring by heading to timing71.org to follow along with your favorite team and drivers in the real and virtual worlds of motorsports. Let's dive straight into our pre-show presented by Butt Kicker and recap the last time out at Homestead. Uh, quite a few cautions, Justin, including one moments from the end, but it was Adam Blocker taking victory and starting his quest for a fourth consecutive title in a row on top. And it was a dominant race for Adam Blocker in the second half, especially where he was able to break away from the private label team Hype Machines to be able to pull away by more than two seconds and then played the strategy perfectly to be able to grow that gap even more so for the closing stages before those caution flags started to fly. It was a race, though, as you talked about, where attrition did come into play with some big-time incidents, with several drivers getting collected into massive incidents. Today, though, is going to be a challenge for Adam Blocker because this is the chance to prove, okay, I can do this again. It's going to be difficult, though, here at Long Beach, especially with its tight corners. First street course of the season, and it's a very interesting schedule that we should take a look at right now because we head to Phoenix in a couple of weeks' time as well, Justin, for what is two very crucial races. Homestead, we talked about the attrition there. Long Beach and, and Phoenix, very similar. And you don't want to be heading into Watkins Glen, round four of this championship, already on the back foot when someone like Blocker is already looking oh so strong. Momentum is so critical when it comes to a series such as this, especially with the talent level, and it's going to be very difficult as a result during these next couple races because Long Beach is known for its attrition, especially with its tight hairpin corners and its hard braking zones where drivers are likely going to be able to send it throughout the day today. For Phoenix, 
It's the type of racetrack where it's a short track. Anything can happen throughout the race where drivers are carrying massive speeds and in turn carrying massive speeds in the corner exits where drivers could snap around. Both of these next couple races are going to be very pivotal to try and carry momentum forward. If you want to try and set yourself up early for the championship, you don't want to be playing the catch-up game. And speaking of points, let's take a look at our series standings presented by Butt Kicker. It is the defending champion blocker on top. A couple of bonus points as well to his credit. But interestingly as well, a private label team hype. A very interesting a debut for them, Justin. They had a very strong performance early, kind of tailed off late. But you've got a very interesting rookie battle. Jason Brophy, Henry Bennett up there in third and fourth. Uh, these standings really are shaking up to be a very interesting 22 calendar season. Absolutely, and Harrington, Brophy, and Chin were dominant, as you talked about in the first half of that race at Homestead Miami Speedway, where they helped set the tempo early on for that race and looked to be the drivers to beat early on. Just in the end, Blanca had the better pace at the end of the race and the better strategy in turn to be able to break the toe and break the draft for the rest of the grouping. That being said, it's been some great starts for drivers like Jason Galvin, for Tony Shelman as well, to be able to get inside the top seven in points so far this season. It's the interesting mark, though, of who stays there after today's race is going to be the tricky part to see who is consistent, not just on the ovals, Arjuna, but on the road courses. So there's only four organizations represented in this top ten. Let's talk about the team championship presented by HyperX. You can see the... Uh, gap that the private label boys are already building there, Justin. But that is going to be crucial as we head to the street circuit for the first time. Uh, the rookies, Brophy and uh, Henry Bennett, they will be the interesting ones to watch out for. Because, of course, Adrenaline Motorsport, we know how strong they are. Uh, one thing I want to point out right now, Adam Blocker, he's representing Adrenaline Power Slide all by himself. He sits eighth in these team standings. Which is remarkable, to say the very least, to start off the season, but... I don't know how long that can hold, of course, being on your own, essentially, for that total and tally, rather, at the moment. But for private label team hype, they made it clear that they wanted to perform very strong this season to show what they could do at the highest levels of motorsport on the iRacing platform. They did that to start off the season. Can they keep it up is the big question here at the road course. For Adrenaline Motorsports, we know how quick some of those drivers are. You mentioned Henry Bennett, for example. He's known for being a road course ace in particular, Arjuna. It's going to be critical for both of those organizations to have solid runs today to make sure that they can keep things up if they want to win the team championship. And we talked about rookies, a strong rookie class, but it is going to be two veterans in the IndyCar really scrapping it out. Here are these rookie standings presented by Butt Kicker. Uh, it's Brophy and Bennett. You mentioned the strength from Bennett on the road courses, but in an oval dominated calendar, Justin, uh, odds maybe do favor someone who's a bit bolder. And I definitely think at this point in time, lot of, lots of confidence on the side of Jason Brophy. I think there definitely is a lot of confidence indeed. He performed really well. He led laps, looked like he was one of the drivers to be, as we talked about, over at Homestead Miami Speedway. But the road courses are going to be some of the big challenges. He was working with some drivers over this week, for example, in this car, at tracks like the Nürburgring. He, and has been one of the top contenders on the open side of things in official racing as well. That being said... It's going to be intriguing how that plays back and forth. Don't count out drivers like Nunez or Kalisto, for example, though, or Chris Fowler, who had some good speed in their respective runs at Homestead Miami Speedway as well. This is going to be an intriguing battle throughout the entire season to see, especially towards the middle of the top five, how the rookies fare out this season. Let's dive into our series details presented by Minus 273, the premier name in carding gloves. Their industry leading gloves are super lightweight and durable, made of breathable poly spandex. Whether you're a kart or a sim racer, Minus 273 gives you the control to reach victory lane. For more information on Minus 273's full live line of gloves and apparel, visit minus273.biz and don't forget to use promo code minus 273 lhrs 15 for 15% off all orders. And of course, Justin here with a custom fix setup, drivers will have the in-car tools to take ad advantage of. But the interesting thing for the first time in Lionheart uh, series history, we've got tire compounds. Drivers will have to take one green flag lap with both the primary and the alternate tires. And with two pit stops expected, a strategy is very much up in the air. 
They're out practice, Arjuna, with some of the top drivers in the series. The separation amongst the red wall tires and the white wall tires was up towards two seconds, in fact, for our drivers. So there's a lot of chances for major strategy plays throughout the race today. Fuel has also been a talking point as well to see how things play out there. Many drivers expected to stretch it further along to about 23 laps or so in potential Arjuna. So it's going to be interesting when they elect to use those tire compounds. I think that's going to be very pivotal on how the start of this race could even play out. And the first time that we visit the streets of Long Beach in the IndyCar series, of course, uh, this track existed in point cloud format for so many years. Uh, the Lionheart Retro Series, in fact, came here in their first ever season. Two drivers competed for the win there. Jason Galvin, Ryan Otis. We'll see them in action today as well. But more importantly here, Justin, Adam Blocker, he has dominated the streets of Detroit in the past. Safety cars might be on the table as well. Who is going to take victory here in the HyperX Grand Prix of Long Beach? It's going to be very intriguing to say the very least because it could go to anybody based on what was seen pace-wise. Drivers like Chin, Harrington, Karam, Otis, Blocker were all quick in practice throughout tonight. But the main trouble spot is going to be especially the run up to start off the race towards the shoreline drive tonight, Arjuna. Because that's been a fear for some of the drivers with its tight circuits. This is the type of race where if you can survive the early portions, you're in a good spot to be able to battle for the race victory. There's the chance for safety cars as a result, though, of that potential risk. After all, the track with here is about maybe a couple car lengths or so at the very most. It's going to be very tight here, Arjuna, to say the very least, for our drivers around this track. No reprieve from the walls. Let's talk about this track. Just under two miles in length, you've got two shoreline drives to work your way through. Seaside Way, one of the most important zones you have to make sure you don't hit the wall, get the run down in towards those penultimate corners. Uh, but Justin, you said attrition is going to be important. 64 laps, a fuel window between 20 and 24 laps, depending on which drivers you talk to. I am very much looking forward to strategy being a major factor here today. I think so as well, especially at this 1.968 mile, 3.1 kilometer road course, 11 turns around here in Long Beach, California. Throughout the beautiful street, some of the best passing zones as well here are going to be today. Both ends of Shoreline Drive, I think, for today. Also keep an eye on drivers as they run their way through Bridgestone all the way up towards the fountain as well and make their way through the tight corners and confounds there. Also could see some hard braking through East Seaside Way as well for drivers as they enter Sector 3 before that run up to the tight hairpin before the start and finish line. Let's jump our way into qualifying. Just over three minutes left in the session, and drivers have four flying laps to set their fastest lap times here. We're watching defending series champion Adam Blocker making his way through turn number five in towards the left-hand hairpin. He's currently in provisional third position, Justin. The top three drivers, they're separated by just over one-tenth of a second right now. And just about everybody except for four drivers have elected to qualify. Keep in mind on the red wall tires here. Rigney, along with Kalisto, Richie Hearn, along with Brian Greenlee. So that's going to be intriguing for a tire strategy overall. For Blocker, though, it's going to be intriguing to see if he's going to be able to get the pull time here with that just one-tenth of a second gap. After all, fuel load's going to be the lightest for these cars here. A decent launch down the front straightaway here. Let's see what the time is. Final flying lap for Adam Blocker as well. What is it at the line? 107, 176. He improves, but only marginally. He stays in third position. Karam is up into first. He's pipped Joshua Chin by just over three hundredths of a second. That is a very interesting qualifying lap time. We watch another car working its way down on towards East Seaside Way right now. This is Matt Taylor on these red mark tires, Justin. Couple more corners for Taylor to really improve on what is a very difficult mid-pack qualifying time right now. Yeah, majority of the field. In fact, in the 108s right now, outside the top 14 positions right now. So if I'm Taylor, get yourself at least a few car lane or at least a few tenths quicker here. We've seen he's got the pace, especially in the speedway side of things here. But for him, does get a little bit better, much better in fact.
He jumps his way up into fifth. Great drive there. Closing stages of qualifying. 90 seconds left on the clock. Drivers will have one final opportunity to set qualifying lap times. There are some big names down the order here, Justin. And most interestingly for me, Andrew Kinsella, the Canadian, he's down in 22nd position. He's got a lot of work to do now to climb his way up through the field. Yeah, that's going to be very difficult to be able to make your way through this field. Jason Brophy of known in 20th position as well. That time is about 1.2 seconds off the pull time. Our drivers like Mike Rasmus in 14th position did well in the retro series over at Watkins Glen. You have some very solid road course rainers, to say the very least, Arjuna, who are going to be very much challenged here to stay out of trouble. This is going to be one of the most intriguing starts to the season so far. I think in all three series as a result with so many fast drivers in the mid-pack, and some drivers overall looking to showcase what they can do and shock some people up towards the front. Less than 30 seconds remain. Jay Brandt around the final hairpin. That will be a very tricky spot come at the start of the race. He dives onto pit road. 20 seconds left, Justin. And not many cars able to set a lap time right now. Quick expectation before we head to see the starting grid. I think it's going to be a crazy start to this race at the very least, Arjuna. But it's going to be a race where I think once things settle on in, things are going to get calm. And it's going to become where the true talent and skill and preparation comes in for our drivers it's going to become the question did you prepare enough for this road course did you prepare enough to be able to perform around long beach let's go trackside at the streets of long beach and take a look at a butt kicker starting grid on pole position it is sage Karam, a real life indy car driver he's got a very prime opportunity here to take another race victory in the Lionheart Indy Car Series. Alongside him, Joshua Chin, the king of chins himself. He might have some fuel saving up his cars. Defending series champion Adam Blocker, he starts on the inside of row number two. A Connor Harrington in the number 44 on his outside. Matt Taylor, a very impressive qualifying performance there. He's up in fifth with the Canadian Brian Carey rounding off row number three. Tyler Graff for Graphics LPM, he lines up in 7th, alongside Aaron Morgan, his teammate. Henry Bennett in ninth. Ryan Otis in 10th, Brian Beard back in 11th, Adam Fraser on the outside of row number 6. We'll work our way through the grid quickly because it's a very short pace lap here. It's Chris Fowler in 13th, Mike Rasmus 14th, Matt Houston 15th, Lionel Callisto back in 16th position, a Stefan Larkamp, a Sandman himself back in 18th position. We'll work through the halfway point in our grid. Samuel Ryman, Jason Brophy, Jay Brant, Andrew Kinsella, James Grahula, Justin Weaver, some big names with lots of work to do here from back in the pack. At 25th position, Scott Holmes alongside James Paulson. And then Ron Hacker, jo George Anzaldo, the series organizer, 2.3 seconds off the pace. And then Ricky Harden and Big Joe Hassett for the second time this week. He starts back in the pack. Jason Galvin, Dustin Wardlow, final car setting time. Uh, Luis Gonzalez Nunez, Richie Hearn, Brian Greenlee, and Mike Rigney, 35th and 36th. And then Christopher Reagan, final car in today's field. It's about 50-50 in terms of the tires. Half the field on black, half the field on res. They do not have to start on the tire that they qualified with. And we've got some onboard cameras to work our way through here today. Out front, it will be Sage Karam and Adam Blocker. Two drivers in the top three. They've got some prime looks to take a look at. Karam with the HyperX onboard camera, because whatever you play, however you play, HyperX knows we're all gamers and HyperX is always ready to game. Adam Blocker, he has the Minus 273 onboard camera, the premier name in card and gloves. Visit minus273.biz for more information. It's a short run down to the green flag here. Competition, commitment, excitement. This is Lionheart, and it's Sage Karam at the front of the field as the pace car down on the safety of pit lane, and we get underway with the HyperX Grand Prix of Long Beach. Karam streaks his way down into the first corner, unchallenged. It's Chin and Adam Blocker side by side in towards that very tricky breaking, breaking zone. Blocker will get the move done. Through on Chin, Harrington into fourth, Matt Taylor in fifth, Brian Carey in sixth, Justin, as we enter the fountain for the very first time. And this is where you already want to get single file at the very least. It can be very tricky with attrition if you end up making a mistake in this section of the racetrack. This is now, it leads right into where it opens up. 
right towards West Shoreline to be able to try and set up some potential passes later on today before their turn onto Pine Avenue and their way towards Seaside Way. There have been a number of big crashes up and down through the field. The likes of Kinsella, uh, Brian Greenlee getting mixed up in this one. We have some replays that we'll have to work our way through, Justin. Out of 37 cars that took to the green flag as Sage Karen comes down into the final corner here. We've only got 30 of them still circulating on track. Not the way those drivers would have wanted to start this event, to say the very least, but... It's been a picture-perfect start for Sage Karam. For Sage Karam, we know the experience he has when it comes to driving an IndyCar. He's utilizing that right now in the road courses. He dominated in the retro series over at Watkins Glen and pulled away by a significant margin in that race, keep in mind, to be able to take that checker flag looking like a solid start for him as we take a look at what happened here. I think there's a number of replays to work our way through. This is Weaver, uh, unassisted potentially into the fountain section. Looks in okay in front of him. Oh, Kinsella has a good uh, rear view mirror shot of what happened there. Kinsella has his own accident by himself, Justin. Causes a big checkup out of the fountain. And a bad spot to be stuck in as well as that forced him to tow with him being in a very bad spot to try and turn around there. Very unfortunate for Kinsella as that takes him out of contention very early in this race. As a result, though, several drivers have moved up several positions. Jason Galvin up seven. Nunez up seven who started at the back. Mike Rigney started at the back in eight positions already gained. Towards the mid-pack, drivers like Samuel Ryman already up plus two. James Kuhua plus three in the early going. But already the gap, nearly two seconds. Karam looking nice and calm so far. Well, in the top 10, Justin, only one change of position. That was Blocker on chin down into turn one. Blocker was assisted by that push to pass. A little bit of power that you can get down into the braking zone. I don't think chin fought it too hard. Strategy now, though, has to come into effect, Justin, because uh, we were talking before we came on air. Adam Blocker has already told me uh, he thinks he may be able to go 23 laps without any fuel saving. When you think about the fact that drivers have to run the black and the red marked tire in today's race, and that will really make his uh, black marked stint that much shorter and might save him that much more time as well. Absolutely agree with you, especially since the majority of your lead cars did elect to go with the red wall of tires here to start things off. So this is going to be a case where drivers are definitely going to be thinking about that big picture play, trying to limit milk a time on those tires to try and maximize the amount of time on the racetrack. This is why the preparation in many cases comes down to hours upon hours, right, Arjuna, to be able to prepare for these races. The interesting mark is drivers like Joshua Chin are on those other wall tires, for example. Majority of his other competitors around and behind him are, as mentioned, on those red wall. That's a very good point. I didn't mention it right off the bat. The two private label cars at the front, they're on the black mark tires. Two cars in front of them running away very slightly. Gap between Chin and Blocker about two seconds now. We're watching, though, a rookie Henry Bennett. He's a five-time iRacing IndyCar Open champion. Uh, speaks the volumes of ability and experience he has on these road courses, Justin. But he's under a little bit of pressure right now from behind. Uh, that's Ryan Otis tucked up behind him. And you can see in front, Tyler Groff is slightly pulling away at this point in time. And we talked about this a little bit at Homestead Miami Speedway. Ryan Otis, of course, known for his experience in the Lotus 79 with all the success in the retro series in particular, trying to be more and more adjusted to the modern machine so far. So that can take some time to be able to come to grips with things, to be able to learn the nuances, to be able to get used to the tools as well. So for Otis, though, it's been a strong start for him so far, Arjuna. On board with Tyler Graff. Two more cameras to talk about. We didn't get a long run from uh, the pace car pulling off down into the green flag. Uh, Tyler Graff with the Graphics Esports on board. World-class design from the real world to virtual. Visit graphicsesports.com to find out more. He gets the move done on the inside. Uh, is that lap traffic? I think that might be Justin. That's big Joe Hassard, in fact, from 31st position, who already has had to come in to pit for some trouble. So the 11 machine already is among your lapped cars in this race, yes. Not the best of starts for Joe Hassard after showing some decent speed at Homestead, Miami. And he's not enjoyed the start to his Lionheart Speedway Series uh, season, rather, either. It's not been good. Uh, so 
unfortunately for him, he's going to struggle at the start of this IndyCar race as well. There's been a number of cars, Justin, that I've seen struggling. James Paulson is the most recent one to pull himself back down onto pit road. How many cars are down on pit road? Some of our uh, viewers may be wondering. I'm counting four right now. Paulson, Wardlow, Greenlee, and Weaver. Fortune for Wardlow, who had the butt kicker on board camera. What you see is what you hear is what you feel. And unfortunately, the feelings early on is disappointment if you're a part of that organization. Jason Galvin with some problems has now had to come down to the pit lane. There's a number of cars who have retired recently. Let's see if we can go and spool up a race spot TV replay for a real-world announcer in Jason Galvin. He got in a bit of hot water for some comments on Monday night. Uh, let's finds himself in some hot water here at Long Beach as well. Slightly different variety one of a number of cars pulled down onto pit road at this point in time we're watching a nice little battle uh, for sixth position but onto this replay we take a look justin and oh it's that deep breaking zone into east seaside way and he finds himself in the ties kinsella uh, might just have actually accumulated a bit more damage there yeah just tried to dodge it there kinsella in fact way too much speed carried in and it hit the curb that also added to the effects there into the tire wall so for Jason Galvin, absolutely demolished early on. So that now adds five drivers already down the pit lane. And there's still three drivers, keep in mind, who are laps down, who are still circulating. And we're only on lap seven of this race. Very early on, as some battles starting to break out a little bit here. This is uh, Matt Taylor, who sees Aaron Morgan slipping it down the inside. Morgan gets the move done very nicely assisted by the push to pass as well he's already used the button four times in this race only six pushes left and he's on, only on lap seven justin he's very aggressive and that might hurt him later on when he wants to try and defend from other drivers trying to come back at him it's a great point because you don't want to end up spamming the button and all of a sudden you're down to one you want to be able to save them so you have, say, four or five to be able to attack later on, if not six or seven. So it's something you need to think about big picture here. But I also think at the same time, it's just showing the difference in the tire compounds as well. Because Taylor is on the alternate compound here at the moment. That's why in part he's seven tenths of a second difference right now between him and Morgan right now. And eventually, it's going to be curious how the pace potentially evens out amongst those compounds with the longer run of the alternate compound compared to the sprint compound trouble for the 62 meanwhile that's stefan larkamp one of matt taylor's teammates who's ooh, found himself at one of the penultimate corners facing in the wrong direction joshua chin has had an issue as well oh no the king of chins in the number 93 car he's down on pit road he might be out of this race justin and that is a big contender being caught out very early in today's race and it's from a big time mistake, and in fact, I think Arjuna, when it comes to Joshua Chin, let's take a look. This is going to be the run going off into the first corner, in fact, down off the front straightaway. Way too much speed, similar to Jason Galvin's incident, right into the tire barrier, completely shears the right side tire off the front of the car and the side pod. That may be terminal damage for, Chin, for Joshua Chin today. I would suspect that is day done. At the very least, he will find himself laps down from the rest of the field. One of the championship favorites has been called out and Chin did not enjoy the kind of run that Harrington and Brophy did at the Homestead Miami Speedway. The road courses are his specialty. That promotes Brian Carey up into fourth. Puts a lot of pressure now, Justin, onto Connor Harrington. He's in third and the private label Team Hype hopes are resting now on the number 44. Especially since Jason Brophy, as you talked about, is still in 19th position and struggling. So this puts a lot of pressure indeed on him to make sure there is no contact with the wall and to hope that the strategy works out. If I'm Chin, though, I'm hopping onto the pit box if I can and trying to assist his drivers and try and give as much support as he can to his respective competitors. By the way, Matt Taylor has been reeled in by an air train of drivers. Graf, Bennett, Otis, and Frazier among the drivers closing in. And remember, this will flip around at the 
end of the race in those closing stages when uh, these cars on the red mark tires they may be on the blacks and they will really be struggling in comparison to someone like taylor the gap between caram and blocker that's up to five seconds right now harrington finds himself almost 8.5 seconds adrift from the defending champion brian carey is hunting him down one second back now and similarly to what we're seeing right now with the graphics esports on board and graph closing in on the black mark tires the canadian brian carey is doing the same for the third and final podium position we're about halfway through the fuel stint right now justin and it does mean these cars will start to pick up some speed it'll be slightly easier to control as well especially since they're going to be much more lighter as well and as these drivers keep in mind are going to be also making their adjustments in car with the weight jackers and whatnot to make sure of that they properly make their way around said corners here and those adjustments are going to be very much critical here to make sure you keep in mind of those in-car tools built this entire race to balance out the potential tire wear if that can come into play here keep in mind that the fall-off for some of these drivers has been minimal for others they've seen fall off of up to six tenths and, and it's all a fixed setup as well so it's about driver style maybe a little bit of in-car tools will come into effect you've got the front and rear arbs to play around with you can make it softer make it harder might help you out very slightly as we complete lap 11 here for this mid pack they will come across the start finish line side by side you'll see right now brian carey has closed on down connor harrington the gap now below one second and as we work this point of the run justin how aggressive is someone like carey gonna be here he knows that harrington will get onto those faster tires and maybe will pick up some speed but at the same time he knows that track position might be very important I think right now, at the very least, if you see an opportunity, take it. But at this point, I don't think you're necessarily going to be too, too aggressive. It's the matter of keep... As long as Aaron Morgan doesn't get too, too close, if I'm Brian Carey, I think I'm okay right now. I'm feeling comfortable with where I'm at, especially with the strong run and knowing that the tire strategies are going to be differentiating later on in this race. Now, it all comes down to, as well... If you battle too long as well here, Arjuna, that's where you lose a ton of time. So you don't want to necessarily battle too, too much. So in other words, I think we see him keep it nice and calm. I wouldn't use a push to pass or anything like that. There is traffic ahead as well. Brian Carey has only used the button once. You can see Harrington makes his way through on that lap traffic. Uh, James Grahula has had uh, an incident. He's the latest victim of the streets of Long Beach now. Unfortunately um, for the Sim Racing Merch Esports driver, another victim. And I don't know which corner it was, Justin, but uh, they really are starting to fall like flies. We talked about attrition being so important here today. Uh, you're not seeing you know, just even the rookie drivers on these road courses getting caught out. The likes of Kinsella, the likes of Chin, uh, the biggest names on the road courses yeah and that just shows the difficulty of the circuit because it's very treacherous and tricky it's very fun to drive to say the very least in one of the most beautiful circuits i have to say on iRacing with its detail but it's also very difficult james grohua for example is going to show it right here you carry too much speed in one corner you're slamming into a tire barrier or one of the retainer walls set up around this circuit you carry too little speed, you're losing a ton of time. So the level of confidence is also so very pivotal here if you want to be fast at Long Beach. And we've seen that already with some of these drivers with some of their speed early on. Looking, by the way, at Henry Bennett fending off Lionheart Retro Series champion Ryan Otis, who makes the switch into the modern machinery. He trades the Lotus 79 and its rather raw ground effect for the modern Dallara IR18 and a much more sophisticated take on ground effect rearward shot from henry bennett and the british racing green as we dive into the fountain section you mentioned it there justin it really is a beautiful interpretation that i racing has delivered for so many years it was a claim that it was going to be too much work for the team to do but of course the last 12 months have really thrown uh, plans for a toss and it's a wonderful achievement from the i racing service and i I do think that the staff members might have been buoyed by this news because, of course, uh, today it was announced that NASCAR and iRacing, they partnered, partnered up to design a brand new street circuit in Chicago, and that will be playable on the iRacing.com service first. Which is absolutely incredible, to say the very least, and it's going towards the direction that I could see for the future, especially for motorsports, is iRacing provides a platform for sanctioning bodies to potentially 
test various different track layouts or concepts. It's been seen in the past, for example, for stock car racing in recent years, for example. It allows opportunities for things to be tried out in the sim before you apply them in the real world. So it's going to be intriguing how that road course at Chicago, in the city of Chicago, downtown Chicago, is going to play out, especially later on this year. Now it'll be playable, I think, fairly soon on the iRacing service. It will be available to the pros first in the eNASCAR Pro Invitational. And I'll, of course, can the, the keys to the track over to us shortly as well. And Matt Taylor has done a rather impressive job at this point, I must say, Justin, to hold off these red mark tires from behind. He hasn't used a single one of his push to passes yet, but he really has frustrated the likes of, uh, who is this? Tyler Graf, Henry Bennett, and Ryan Otis as well. And this is almost a bit of a draft train of sorts that started to form up a little bit here with the dirty air starting to factor in. It's been difficult to pass, and we've seen this come into play so far, where if you get a massive run or force a mistake, that's your opportunity to pounce. If you don't get that mistake, it can be tricky to make said move. I think at this point, though, that the alternate tire compounds and maybe even doubt a little bit here is Ricky Harden's now had a problem. You see the left-hand side of your screen. He's towed back down onto pit road. That put him temporarily at the front. I don't think that will get him the bonus point, Justin. But once more, another car falling a foul here. 37 cars starting. And we're now down to, I think it's about 26 or so that haven't had to come down onto pit road yet. It's one more victim of turn number one. And the number seven car rear end steps around in a very quick hands there, I think, from a number of cars to get out of the way. Some of the drivers starting to report, in fact, that they're starting to get a little bit free in some of these corners. And I think that's just with the speed of some more smokes popped up. That's Ron Hacker, who's just looped it by himself. He's been having a torrid day. He's already one lap down, finds himself finally resetting onto pit road. Uh, might pull, uh, close the day rather for what has been a, a day where he spun I think about four times so far, Justin. And again, this is an oval dominated league. A lot of these drivers much more comfortable on the high banks of somewhere like a Homestead, Miami, for example, than the streets of Long Beach. But it doesn't mean that they won't head out onto track and challenge themselves to the best of their abilities. Absolutely. And one thing to keep in mind though, Arjuna though, at the same time is the challenges of these tire compounds. We were talking about this before. Do you think they feel they've cliffed? Because it's obvious that these red side wall tires for most of the field have fallen off a cliff in terms of pace by upwards of more than a second. At this point, the drivers on the harder compound tire are really taking advantage of this. Very much so. Harrington is now 20 seconds behind the race leader, but lapping uh, six tenths of a second quicker than Blocker the last time around. Sage Karam's fastest lap in the race, a 107.069. A last time around, a 108.342. Blocker responds this time, a 108.031. Uh, by the way, if you want to follow along with live weather conditions, head on over to timing71.org. A current track temperature, Justin, 36 degrees Celsius. You can see up there on the screen as well. That has been changing through the course of the day because you can see there it is cloudy and there's lots of cloud cover to uh, very much make this a dynamic track for the drivers to handle. Not just cloudy, it's most quality. So there's going to be a, a very big set of clouds coming over the skyline of these machines here in Long Beach throughout the race with various patches of sun coming through. So that's going to potentially cool down this track plenty as the day goes on throughout for these drivers under the sun. Well, when the sun comes out, I should rather say under the clouds, I should rather say. But one driver just crashing the wall in front of the race lead battle here. Matt Holmes, Scott Holmes rather, nearly crashed right in front of Matt Taylor into a tire barrier. And he's now pulling out of the way of a number of other cars that will let them on through. You can see here comes the pack streaking down East Seaside Way. A very nice shot of car single file, Justin. It's what we've seen since the start of the race, and it's kind of what we expected as well. Other than Blocker getting past on the red mark tires on Joshua Chin into turn one, it's been a race of attrition, and I'm now waiting. We are laps away from the pit stop window opening. When is Karam going to come down? When is Blocker going to come down as well? My suspicion, Adam Blocker, seven seconds behind the race leader, he's been doing a little bit of fuel saving. That has to be the thought process, is 
with that big of a gap for Karam, he's been going flat out in the 108s for much of this run, so it's much more different in terms of that fuel pace. So keep in mind, you only make it to 20 laps, there's a chance you have to try and go for an extra stop here. So you want to go for those extra couple laps that Blocker talked about. Because if you don't go for those extra laps and take those laps right now, then you lose a ton of time, at least 41 seconds of delta time, by going down the pit lane that additional time. So that's got to go through the mind of these drivers right now. On board with Blocker with the minus 273. On board. Third number from the left is the push to pass usages left. Blocker still has nine. Karam has been using them a little bit more aggressively on the recent couple of laps, Justin. He's down to six uses left in this race. I think he's been trying to use this traffic as an opportunity to build the gap up once again. But watch the hands here from Adam Blocker. So smooth, so calm, so in control of what that car is doing across a very bumpy circuit this is why he is a th three-time champion looking to become a four-time champion and that smoothness is so critical in all aspects of motorsports especially in this type of type of car because in the lower ir18 you go with for with sudden movements back and forth on the steering wheel you're likely snapping around the car as you lose the back tires with this machine you have to be very smooth and precise and calm and patient on the gas and how hard you push on said gas pedal. A little bit of tire spin right there, getting harder onto the gas there, for example. You do that several times, it gets you into trouble. Those smooth movements on the steering wheel as well, make sure you keep your tires cool as well and a bit more safe, to say the very least, for these types of races. Walker clears Nunez. Up front here is Sage Karam in his HyperX sponsored machine now. He's signed a deal with HyperX to stream all of their races and it's only fitting he's got the onboard camera as well what a wonderful shot we have here uh, made by Tyler our producer as well Justin you get a cockpit kind of camera view here you can see a little bit of bumps you can see a little bit of the g-forces as well but more importantly you get that view of the error screen as well yeah, right from the visor in particular here and you can see uh, some of those movements as well we were talking about this for the Speedway Series as well. Head motions added for some of the Dolara chassis in particular, Arjuna, as well. So those motions come into play here with the amount of G's you're carrying around this racetrack and how much speed you're carrying forward. More than 160 miles an hour in particular for Karam, where he's a bit more rugged on the steering wheel movements. But the thing is, he's still in the 107s in clean space. He's been trying to push hard to build up this gap up to nine seconds. Well, I think the one thing you're seeing from Karim is uh, he said from day one, he builds his simulator to be like his IndyCar as well. He's got his force feedback cranked to the maximum. Quick snap of hands there to catch the car coming through turn number six. I wonder how sore his arms will be after today's race. He's gearing up for another crack at the Indy 500 in the month of May. Rumors circulating about his ride with Dreyer and Ryan Bolt racing, hopefully things go his way maybe we'll see HyperX on that car as well here is Henry Bennett though in that battle for sixth position he's cleared Tyler Groff in the recent moments and you can see the gap between Taylor and Bennett is now 1.7 seconds at the tail end of the uh, fuel window here Justin the red mark tires are very much starting to burn off here is that pass down into turn one Bennett just was given the opportunity up the inside. Graf just gives him the space. You don't want to go side by side in that section, otherwise you can push into the tire barrier. Seen Ryan Oates just nearly actually did push into it, watching them battle for position. And now becomes the test. Can Bennett get past Taylor if he can get to Taylor is the big question, especially since we are inside that window, as you talked about, and everybody has pushed it past that 20 lap estimate. Harrington down on pit road on those black mark tires. This is the earliest he can come down. He will shed those tires. He will not have to use them for the remainder of the race. He will be on the primary tires now and the ones that he wants to be on. Excuse me, they're called the alternate tires, Justin, but they really are the tires that he wants to be on. Harrington up on the box right now, getting the fourth fresh set of rubber. Yes, indeed. And going with the red wall tires, indeed. Quick stop for Harrington of nine seconds or so. Look, Graf and Ryan Otis. Otis has just continued to apply the pressure here. And they're just getting to the very edge of dragging their side pods against those walls. And that section of the racetrack is Harrington's off and away. It is so tight 
around the circuit as we're hearing Graf is going to be coming in this time by and several more have come in including Sage Karam this time. Karam down on pit road. Otis tries to get his way past as well. Blocker stays out. This is what we were expecting. How long can he make it stick? Oh, Stefan Larkamp, Andrew Kinsella. There's been a small issue for those two drivers. Larkamp has retired from this race as well. They are falling like flies, Justin, and we are in the pit stop window. Not the time you where you want massive, massive trouble or have to take a tow when you already have to come into pit in the first place is here they go into that tight pit lane. You can see just a quick bobble to the right over to the other side of the median to be able to come over into the pit lane. Just about everybody coming in. George and Zardo and several others crash in the pit entry. Oh, there's a big stack up right now. They've had to reset a couple of cars. Mike Rasmus and Enzaldo have both had to take the tow. Well, get a replay up on your screen in just a few moments' time. But my, oh my, drama on pit road. And we expected it to play a factor. Not this much of a factor. Blocker, will he come down onto pit road this time around? That is the question. Has he been able to elongate the stint one further lap? He's peeling to the right, Justin. He's down onto pit road. Only him and Jay Brand have been able to do so to stretch this stint an extra lap. Everyone else coming in about 22 laps or so. So it's looking like, at the very least, going to be a potential two-stopper for just about a majority of the field if they hit the same marks. This is what happened, though, with that incident. And Zardo tries to come in as they're side-by-side. -side. Wow. That's going to be an interesting one. I'm not sure if Rasmus was actually committing onto pit road here, Justin. It kind of looks like he was trying to stay out there. Maybe just thinking Enzaldo would give way. That is not the way things will work. And race control will take a very dim view of that. Blocker rolls off the jacks, though. He's now trying to get up to racing speed. Karam already down into turn one. Blocker actually was able to close up a touch bit with the stop by maybe about half a second or so with the pit stop sequence, but it's now going to be the question of how they fare out with the different compounds here. They are on vice versa compounds. Karam went with the alternate compound with the white tires, the red wall tires for Blocker on this sequence. So this is going to be a true test to see can Blocker reel on in Karam now with the different compounds. And this is the stint. He's got to not just pull the gap in. He's got to make the move happen, Justin, because as soon as the tires have you know, switched on over, Blocker will finish this race on the slower mark tires. Uh, Karam will have the advantage. He cannot afford to give the real-life IndyCar driver too much of a chance here, as he will take it with all the opportunity he can, he can get. 100% agree with you on that one. It's just going to be difficult to close in what is going to be a 9.3, 9.4 second gap. It all comes a bit down to the traffic, though, and the timing, though, because they're, they've they already gone to the point, this is how quick the pace has been, that they're nearly lapping their way to 14th. By the way, let's take a look at some of the replays here. Kinsella had some struggles early on. He's had some more. I think that was Larkamp potentially that was also involved. Both of the NHR cars, uh, Larkamp and Fowler, are down on pit road. And we, sit, we keep having to give this update, Justin. 37 starters. I think we're down now to about 24 cars still circulating. You said it just a few moments ago. We're a couple of minutes away from 13 cars being left on the lead lap here. Just shows the incredible pace from Sage Karam throughout the day here. Here's what happened with Chris Fowler here as... Way too much speed and actually just carried to the point where he tried locking it up and hit that back end against the tire wall. So both of those NHR cars down on pit road, day done for them. Uh, in fact, actually, Larkamp is finally rolling off of pit road. He's got whatever repairs he needs to get. And now working through the middle portion of this race, lap traffic, the major factor. Gap between Karam and Blocker, 8.6 seconds right now, Justin. It's not really coming down like I'd expect. Six tenths the last lap around. But like we saw last in, uh, last stint, excuse me, uh, the red mark tires, they may work for the first half of the stint. After that, uh, the black mark tire, it starts to have an advantage. We've well, we seen that for some of these battles here as now more traffic and more smoke they have to continue to kick on through. Have to say, Karam has done a great job throughout this race with regardless of the compounds to pay so far. Here's again what happened to our camp you were talking about as way too much speed that time locked up the left front tire and that's not what you want to do. Unfortunately, a bad time there with the checkup with Kinsella from behind. 
And I think the left rear suspension broke for Larkham. That's why it pitched around very, very violently in front of Karam. I think that's Luis Nunez who's going to really hold up the race leader right now, coming out of the final turn. This is what we have to watch out for now, Justin, because on board with Karam, he jinxed to the left-hand side. He's lost a good half a second down this straightaway now. Yeah, that's not going to be good and not what he wants because the thing is, Karam's been reaching this traffic at the worst possible spot so far this run. Right in the exit of the hairpin, right in the middle of the fountain. The thing is, Blocker's going to eventually have to pass the same traffic. So it's the matter of how it balances back full around as should be worth noting, Jay Brand had an issue, it appears, in Sector 2 this lap that lost him at least one position in the 15. Yeah, he was having a good, strong race. Let's talk a bit about the movers and shakers. Early in the race, it wasn't too much of movement. Uh, Jay Brandt, here is that replay. One more car making a mistake into turn one. He's going to get away with it. He does the sensible thing here, Justin. He pulls to the right-hand side, gets it slowed down, and lives to fight another day. Knew he was going to make a mistake immediately, and that's against, as you said, smart to make sure he didn't crash into the barrier. Instead, went for the street as Chris Fowler having to come in once more, you just seen right there. But some battles starting to form up around this racetrack again with some of these various compounds. The battle for ninth, for example. Frazier, Graf, Kalisto, and how about Enter Sandman? Trying to reel in this battle as well. Trying to hope for some luck. If anything was to happen, he's got a chance to try and reel in. Yes, he's a few seconds behind, but you never know with these types of battles so far and how they've intensified. Here comes a move, potentially. It's going to be Graf versus uh, just lap traffic, excuse me. It really is difficult to tell at this point now, Justin, because they are so intermingled. The top 13 almost one lap down at this point in time. At the rate we're going, I would not be surprised if Sage Karam laps up to about maybe even position 8 at this point. And I'm thinking there's the chance of that at the end of this run at this rate let alone how he fares at the end of the race. It could be even higher at this rate with the way Karim has been playing this out at the front. But keep in mind that the pace differential has been extreme with the confidence and talent levels as well, Arjuna. Some of the drivers in this battle right now running in the 108s, 109s. Your leaders are still in the, in the high 107s, low 108s. Last time around, Blocker was just above the 108s. He's very consistent at this point in time as well. The difference between the top three just separated by about tenths of a second in lap time right now. Don't go anywhere on RaceBot TV. We're going to go side by side midway through stint number two here from the streets of Long Beach. We'll be right back after these messages from our partners.
round two in the Lionheart IndyCar Series, the HyperX Grand Prix of Long Beach. We are midway through the race, working lap 31 out of 64 here, and it is Sage Karam with a nine second advantage over his championship rival, Adam Blocker. Very interesting race so far. Out of our 37 starters, we are down to just under 30 cars still out there circulating on track. My name is Arjuna Kenkipati. Alongside is Justin Prince, Tyler Maxson down in the production booth controlling all of the action. Justin, it's kind of gone the way that we expected. A single file pretty much down into turn number one. It's been a race of attrition and strategy starting to come into play. Especially with the decision on some of these tires and it's come into play for a couple of these positions for others. It's been to where they've been able to grow gaps. But for Matt Taylor, just now moments ago, trouble that ends up breaking his suspension from the top six. Taylor was one of our strong storylines of the night, and now his chances are done. And he started the race on the black mark tires. The sole surviving NHR car still out there on track. We'll try and get one more look at that uh, from the onboard look because uh, we've seen that mistake so many times here today, Justin. What, watch from the left side here. It's just going to be a little bit too fast on entry and things start to go wrong. Yeah, you can see he's trying to cut as hard as he can, trying to lock it up and keep it off the tires, but that's way too late at that point. And you can see the defeat with the steering wheel as well, just keeping it straight as soon as the contact is made, knowing that was going to be terminal damage. He is now done for the day. Already more than 10 DNFs in the race, in fact, including him now. It's been a tough day for oh so many cars. We've still got 11 cars on the lead lap for now. Uh, like I said, I do not think we will end with 10 cars still on the lead lap. Karam, an incredible amount of pace on these black mark tires, Justin. He's been lapping in the same bracket as Adam Blocker has behind on the red mark tire. Yeah, this has been just an incredible drive once more from some of these drivers on the red marks. But to get to that discussion point you were mentioning there, just... Blocker has not been able to reel in Karam. If anything, the tire fall off has gone back in Karam's direction towards the front to be able to continue to grow this gap. Here's a replay for one of our rookies in this championship. Very impressive a run from him at Homestead, but for Nunez this time, just a little bit too much power. He's two laps down at this point in time, uh, but importantly, circulating out there, gaining points, gaining experience as well. Uh, this will all help in nine road courses in our 22 race calendar, it's a uh, schedule that does favor the ovals, but we do visit a number of different types. You've got the 1.5 milers, you've got your super speedways, and next time we'll be at Phoenix for short track racing. Uh, it's always fun when you throw the wings onto these cars, stick the downforce on them, uh, see how much the drivers really trust the car underneath them. A couple of battles are starting to maybe develop at this point in time, Justin. Uh, the ones that I'm watching out for uh, include ones really where strategy is going to be the major factor. I'm watching Aaron Morgan, Brian Carey, Henry Bennett. Uh, Morgan and Carey, they're on the black mark tires. Bennett from behind, he's on the reds, trying to close them down. Now Bennett has to close up a significant amount of time to be able to get up to Carey and Morgan, keep in mind, by at least nine seconds still. It's going to be tricky, but it's not impossible, especially since the fact that Bennett is currently turning lap times one second a lap quicker than him. It's just a matter of when do, does he get there. It's going to be pivotal. I think right now is going to be once they get towards 23 to go, that's where I think the concern has to come into play. Okay, will my tires be melted by then? And am I close enough to be able to get to that to the back end for an error position for a top five? Long Beach, by the way, not always known for being such a glamorous place when uh, Formula One first came here. A much different type of reputation, but over the years, this really has become one of the crown jewel events in the America's motorsport schedule. You've got that doubleheader weekend where, of course, IMSA and IndyCar both take to the streets and, and mix things up. Multi-class racing and then some open wheel action as well. You've also got some interesting other events that get thrown in on that weekend. The stadium super trucks, which are always a 
cocoon to see, jumping over uh, parts of the track, going sideways as well, uh, getting up on all sorts of shenanigans at this point in time. We are halfway done with this race though, Justin. And now the gap between Karam and Blocker is starting to drop 7.2 seconds. Our last couple of laps, Karam has lost time in some lap traffic and Adam Blocker has eaten a second a lap out of that advantage. When in clean space is the pivotal point, and that's the thing. Blocker's now in clean space. It's not going to be as much time gained because he had to pass by at least two different drivers this lap lapily. So that's going to be the tricky spot at this moment. Is just, again, timing out when he gets to the traffic and how this is going to ebb and flow. He has, overall though, Arjuna, you have to say, closed up a net time of about maybe two seconds this stint. But the worrying part, of course, for him is Karam will switch himself back on. Oh, wait. Uh, my timing screen is just updated, Justin. It's telling me Karam is also on the red mark tires at this point in time. So not sure if there's been a slight glitch here. Uh, we'd been talking about Karam Blocker, I think, being on different tire compounds. Uh, I think our graphics are slightly incorrect here. Karam is on the black mark tires. Excuse that. Uh, that got me a little bit concerned for a second there. But... 6.6 .6 seconds the gap now between first and second once again just to go back to the point and once that tire switches around once again Karen will be in the prime position he's got six seconds to the good right now yeah and that's the main cushion right is going to be how that plays out as well and since they're at the very pretty much in the same straightaway is the key thing now and it's obvious that blockers quicker win in the open space. The problem is Sandman and Brand are right up the road as well for him to try and deal with. And the dirty air from that's going to impact him a little bit. This lap, for example, you can see how much and how much more confidence he has to be able to send it under the brakes in towards the fountain, for example, as he scraped the wall a little bit, I believe. Just, just touch kiss with the left front tire there. And really are pushing to the ragged edge. Mike Rigney, by the way, has come down onto pit road, heads back out there, three laps down, and in 21st position. Don't think he's going to be able to get to the end from here. Maybe one uh, pit stop still required in the number 00 car. Blocker pass more lap traffic as Karam comes into the final hairpin already. 14 laps into the stint. And we did see Karam came down first. It does mean slightly shorter pit stop here for Adam Blocker is expected, Justin. I don't think it's really going to get him out in front. If anything, it's just going to give him sight of Sage Karam. And, you know, that mental pressure that he can still go out. He's still got the chance to win this race. Yeah, and that's going to be the key thing, right, is at least for the confidence side. To be able to see your opponent, to try and have that carrot on a stick, if you will of encouragement to say, okay, he's right there. I'm going to start to push hard to get there or have to round. And for many drivers, that's the biggest encouragement that they need, right? Is that push. And right now, for Blocker, that encouragement for now is just getting to that position to have that carrot on the stick. And his teammates, by the way, Adrenaline Motorsports Black, uh, the red contingent, having a decent day. You've got a carry and Bennett up in fifth and sixth, respectively. Of course, Kinsella, unfortunately, down on pit road, retires. Uh, might be finishing down in 30th position, but none of the second team is out there on track today. Uh, Tony Shawan, internet issues mean that he didn't get to even jump into the session. And then you had Chris Stouffer and Joe Branch who were unable to make it as well. So one of our big names in the championship, they will miss out early in terms of points. Uh, but their teammate Adam Blocker, all by himself for Adrenaline Power Sport, uh, Sly, eighth position coming into the race in the team's championships. Very interested to follow his campaign, especially with a number of weeks having to be missed. It was just confirmed I think a couple of days ago uh, Justin but Blocker of course will be in Indianapolis for the month of May trackside with his duties with the Ilmore engineering team uh, but he will have the assistance of an IndyCar legend Carrie Bethausen who's going to help provide a rig for Adam to compete with during the month because uh, there are some very important races that month and in his quest for a fourth consecutive title Blocker is leaving no stone unturned 
and I know he was looking for those opportunities to find various rigs for those types of races. That is huge to be able to have that opportunity now in Indianapolis from the help from the community. That's the big thing for many of these drivers that people don't realize is for different drivers across iRacing, Arjuna, for some of the biggest names that you see across the service when they have real world obligations, they may be going from rig to rig to rig across the country. Drivers like, for example, on the stock car side, I could think of Caden uh, Honeycutt is the best example. Had help from Logan Clampett just a few weeks ago for one of the pro qualifiers, for example, Arjuna. Indeed, and it's a challenge, but it's one that I know Blocker has really uh, tried to deal with heads up. And let's see exactly how it's going to work. A gap now, 5.7 seconds. It continues to come on down. Uh, Karam on the blacks is starting to struggle more than I expected. Uh, track temperature, if you're curious, is down to 34 degrees Celsius. You can follow along uh, on timing 71, Justin. I wonder what that's going to do in the closing stages of this race then. Will that help Adam Blocker or will that help Sage Karam? I think this overall means that there's going to be a lot more grip. It's going to become the question of does this prefer Blocker's style of smoothness and calmness? Or does this help with the amount of pace and ruggedness for Karam? That's got to be all weighed out here by both those drivers and is going to be played out here, I think. Keep in mind, though, they have been trading lap times here. Is let's take a look back at that strategy we were talking about. Carey currently comfortably in fifth, but is slowly really in fourth, we should note. It's only a couple seconds behind Aaron Morgan. Has still five seconds on Henry Bennett. Aaron Morgan has had a very, very impressive run so far. Uh, only has one top five finish in the IndyCar series so far. Only making his 10th start in this championship as well. On the road courses is proving to be a very strong competitor in front of the likes of Brian Carey, Henry Bennett, and then of course your Lionheart Retro Series champion, Ryan Otis. Uh, approaching the pit stops, Sage Karam works lap 18 of his stint. Connor Harrington, who of course came down onto pit road first with the black mark tires. He works lap 19, expecting them in the next couple of laps to come down onto pit road. Oh, it looks like a couple of cars have had issues recently as well. Big Joe Hassert, who's circulating in 19th. He's had a small spin. Now it looks like Chris Fowler as well continues that wretched day as Brian Carey almost runs into some lap traffic there, Justin. Well, that's a big impact to say the very least. Lost him a ton of time in what was a battle under a second after a lot of work from Carey. Just terrible timing of where they reached the traffic there with Big Joe Hesser trying to just hug the bottom line. I think just didn't realize the pace coming up from behind from Carey. But now, got to regroup is the main key point now as a result here if you're Carey to close back up and try and get back in your chance for a position battle here. It will be close, and of course, uh, at pit stop, you can always lose more time than you think. Jay Brant goes a bit deep into the corner. He chases down George Sandman in the 06 in front of him. Uh, gaps are starting to close on up here. Once again, though, it's assisted by the tires, Justin. Yes, indeed. Sandman with those, those black and white wall tires, for example. Hearing, though, that drivers are struggling, keep in mind, around this racetrack behind them. For example, Brophy reporting damage over the radio just now. And drivers are coming into pit this lap. Some strategy coming in. Matt Houston, for example, from 16th just ducked in. Two laps down Houston was. It's been a steady day for many of these drivers. The focus has been keep it out of the walls. Talking about some of the movers and shakers very quickly here, Justin. Richie Hearn. A former IndyCar driver. It's always weird calling him a Lionheart IndyCar Series rookie, but he's up 19 positions so far. It's been a very strong day for him, keeping it clean. A pit road, by the way, is busy. Jason Brophy also down onto pit road. Part of the struggles for him just moments ago, but keep in mind that that battle is still on for Sandman to hold on in front of Brant here, and this is going to be a battle. I don't think either of them are going to want to see major trouble here. It's just going to be interesting if someone tries to undercut the other here on the strategy call or whatnot. They have been having some early calls to make sure they're aware of when they're ducking in for one another after what happened in the first pit stop window. Of course, you're referring to Rasmus and Enzaldo who got together on the entry into pit road. Enzaldo has popped into our YouTube chat. Um, already 
maybe preferred some apologies there. Don't necessarily think it was his fault. A left-hand side of the screen, Tyler Graf in the 26 car for Graphics LPM. He's down onto pit road for the final time today. You can see there, Brophy and Houston, they cycle out right in front of the Sandman. And Jay Brandt, they stick to the right-hand side, don't cause too much trouble. And that was something that Race Control had told the driver to keep an eye on Justin. So a Houston there behind. He lost a bit of time in the battle for position, but more importantly, kept himself clean, kept himself out of trouble. And that's the key thing. Think about the big picture. Think about the points here. Is keep yourself clean. You don't want to end up putting yourself in a bad spot that forces you to push too hard and you make a massively vital mistake. As a driver, you do not want to end up being put in that box where you have to overexert like that overall in this type of race. Harrington and Morgan, they're down on pit road for the final time in this race. Harrington on the red mark tires. Here comes Sage Karam, though, from the lead of the race. He's also making his way down onto pit road. Important stop. The Sandman peels off as well. Uh, this is the money stop, Justin. This is when Sage Karam cannot afford to lose time on pit road. Can't afford any sort of mistakes, to say the very least, especially with this massive amount of time built up throughout the race. He's gone back onto the red wall. Tires should be worth noting Sage Karam has from the pit lane. So the strategy is now coming into play once more. Locker had started to shed time back. Arjuna should be worth noting back into more than six seconds before this pit stop. That's crucial. That was at the end of the stint for Sage, uh, some time that he could have, he can use now to maybe work on the gap and maybe build the gap up once again and then relax in the closing stages of the race. Carry Bennett and Otis, they're down on pit road. We're just waiting now for Adam Blocker to make his final pit stop, Justin. And I do think it will still be Sage Karen with a comfortable lead and on the black mark tires, I'm not really sure what Adam Blocker is gonna be able to do. He stays out for one more lap but he really is in a difficult position here. Yeah, this is not going to be a very easy situation at all, as we've talked about, because, well, at the very least, when he comes into pit, he cycles into second position still. That's the given. It's been the difficult spot of actually getting up to Sage Karam throughout the day today, and for him, it just hasn't been that case throughout the race so far. For Blocker now, it's the matter of getting towards that pit stop window. He's going to have the lightest car on the racetrack. That's the key thing here, Arjuna. And they're trading push-to-pass usages back and forth. Karam only has three uses left in this race. Uh, Adam Blocker still has five. He's been rationing his a little bit more over the course of the stint. Coming through the penultimate corner, he's working lap 22 on the stint. He may be able to go one lap longer here, Justin, but he's stuck up behind. I believe that's Luis Gonzalez Nunez in the 14 car. He's losing lots of time. This is not ideal for Blocker. He's coming down onto pit road. That will lose him even more time. Had to really check up hard. Lost him at least about maybe a second or so before heading that pit lane as Nunez nearly crashed into the pit wall, in fact. So now Blocker has to make this long trek down the lane. It's a 41-second net overall down this lane. Karam is already making his way into the final hairpin. Adam Blocker, actually, I'm just watching the replay back. He almost hit the pit wall. That would have ended his day as well, and not how he would have wanted it to go. Karam across the start-finish line, as here comes Adam Blocker off of pit road. He will beat out Luis Gonzalez Nunez, but there goes Sage Karam. Blocker is still in the pit road, Justin, waiting to get released from the limiter. I think that gap is going to be upwards of about nine seconds. I think there is that potential chance as... Blocker has made his way out of the pit lane. Karam is being held up by traffic right now a little bit, though. It ends up being about under eight seconds, but the damage was still done by that final lap into the pit entry. That lost second is going to be very critical, and this traffic ends up helping a little bit, but the damage is still done. Though I think that will be a struggle now. The battle that we'll want to keep our eyes on is between Ryan Otis and Henry Bennett. This is what's up on your screen. Through the final hairpin, they work. Bennett is on the black mark tires. Otis is on the red. Great over-under attempted from the number 95 car, Justin. He's not on the button, I don't think, at this point in time. But he's looking very feisty. Now he gets on the button, pulls to the inside. He's going to make it look very easy on Henry Bennett. 
Yeah, Bennett giving him the space. In fact, right there, knowing how much speed was carried in. Otis near perfect on the mark. In fact, nearly scraping that wall with how much speed he was carrying. But a well-executed move. Now it's the matter of how far can Ryan get. It's similar to what we've seen with Bennett in the last stint. Where Bennett was the one trying to push. Now it's Ryan Otis who's the one who's trying to push to get up to Aaron Morgan. Switch, by the way, four positions. You mentioned trying to challenge Morgan as Otis now in the pit road. Well, Aaron Morgan had a 13.5 second stop. I believe he had a front wing to change there. That's dropped him behind the Canadian Brian Carey and has put him into the clutches of the Lionheart Retro Series champion and a number 95 car of Ryan Otis. There's lots of pace being displayed right now from Otis, Justin. And even while he was stuck behind Henry Bennett the last time around, a lap time was very impressive from this driver. Yeah, last time a 108.7. Back nearly more than a second, just about faster than Henry Bennett, rather eight tenths of a second quicker this time. 182, or what, 1.7 or so seconds quicker than Henry Bennett. So Otis is coming. He's quick. He's getting up there by about three tenths a lap to get up to Morgan. It's just a matter of when he gets there, I think, really, or rather, when do the tires allow him to get there, or if they do. Track temperature now still relatively stable at 34 degrees Celsius. It's the wind that's maybe gusting slightly more. That cloud cover has very much hung over the track surface over the last 15 laps or so, Justin. And as we enter the next uh, 15 laps and the final 15 laps as they were, Sage Karam, eight seconds is the gap. Adam Blocker unable to close on those black mark tires. All Karam has to do now is keep it out of the wall and he'll take home what will be a ninth victory in the Lionheart IndyCar Series. He's been dominating, to say the very least. Whenever he's been on the red wall tires, he hasn't dropped really more lower than the 107s in clean space. Karam's just been a rocket today. It's been incredible to watch this drive, to say the very least. It's been an incredible race overall for Karam overall. Another dominating performance and continuing to set purple lap times on the racetrack. He dominated at Watkins Glen. You mentioned that in our pre-show, Justin, and I wonder if this is a statement for the rest of the season on these road courses. He got pole position in qualifying. He has not looked back since then. Once more on the visor cam, rerun with Sage Karam. In through turn six, we're about to come, and once again, you'll see not necessarily as smooth as Adam Blocker, but the speed is clearly there, and you notice the weight is transferring in a slightly different way, a slightly more aggressive, if you ask me. And I think that's the key word, aggressiveness, coming in. He's got the confidence to be that aggressive, make it away around the racetrack. There's a reason he races in the real world. You have to have a ton of talent to be able to do that in the first place. And for that to then carry over to the sim is also something that takes a lot of talent overall because for some, it's like a light switch. Into the sim you go, over the talent crosses over. It's been like that for Karam. For others, it can take some time to be able to get up to speed. For Sage Karam, it's been like a light switch throughout this entire race. The switch today, though, has been about the speed, and it's back to super fast. It's now almost 10 seconds, that gap between him and Blocker now. 107, 524 last time. He is really setting himself loose right now. Uh, uh, talking about how much experience he has in the sim world, we talked to him on the Race Bot TV podcast a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were just talking with our producer, Tyler Maxson, a couple of hours ago about iRacing ID numbers. And the magic number is about 15,000. That's when the first official iRacing customers started signing up. Uh, they go up in increments from there. Sage Karam, 15,000. 457. He has been a part of the service since the early days. He very much enjoys the challenge, he enjoys competing, and he's set his sights on finally achieving victory in one of the Lionheart Championships this year. Looks to try and set a statement not just in the Retro Series, but here in the Indy cars as well. This is Richie Hurd chasing down Samuel Ryman. And once again, it feels weird saying IndyCar rookie, Richie Hearn, but he's all over the back right now of GSRC's own Justin and looking very aggressive. Ryman not even going to contest the move here. Not going to even hold him up. Actually, they have fellow commentators over at GSRC as well. Sammy Ryman also in that group <laughs> and as well as Richie Hearn to help add to that. So a bit of co-worker battling 
that are in. Yeah. You kind of don't want to have an argument saying, why do you make that dive bomb on me the next time you see someone for a, for a broadcast? Yeah, good point there, Justin. Uh, next time they get behind the booth, there may be a little bit of, oh, you made that easy for me, maybe a bit of ribbing as well. But it is great to see Richie uh, in competition. He has a little bit of internet issues. He lives in rural Nevada, but very much enjoys getting behind the wheel of a virtual indie car. And of course, has lots of experience in the real world as well. Interestingly here, you'll see left-hand side, the gaps uh, very much starting to build up once again, Justin. Closing stages of this race, it's when mental fatigue starts to play a factor. I wonder if we've seen attrition play a factor at the start, and it might start to play a factor in these closing stages as well. Yeah, I'm wondering if for some of these drivers, that could come into play for the absolute mistakes indeed. These drivers have already been turning laps for more so than an hour plus straight around this circuit with the lap times being a minute plus per lap around. Richie Hearn is starting to show a little bit of trouble right now though, I've noticed. He is starting to really get close to these laps, wondering if he's starting to reach that fatigue level. I think he's just enjoying himself. Look how close to the walls he's running, Justin. And it's something that I was thinking with Sage in particular. You know, it must be a, an interesting kind of parallel because I'm sure while, you know, the handling is fairly similar and uh, maybe differences, of course, but the main factor that is different across the sim versus reality is the lack of danger and the lack of knowing that you're plowing into turn one at it speeds in excess of 250 kilometers an hour hoping that the car will stick when you slam onto the brakes you don't have to worry about that and for someone like sage who doesn't know what it's like to be involved in some rather big contact in somewhere like indianapolis there isn't that little thing in the back of your mind saying slow down be careful instead it's go faster it's not gonna hurt you're right and Mention that a bit to me as well when discussing things as well, but you have to keep in mind it can be hard to replicate that feeling for the sim compared to the real world. It really depends on how much equipment you have and the price range, to be quite frank, in some cases. Some drivers run with motion rigs as well. You talked about, for example, Imagine somebody running in a full motion rig and you have that contact. You can bring that feeling in, but not everybody can have a motion rig that allows you to feel that all the time. Yeah, our producer Tyler Maxson is pointing that out as well. How does he know you wonder well? A 16-year-old competes in the IMSA Michelin Pilot Challenge driving a Hyundai Veloster TCR car for Copeland Motorsports. He knows that feeling. He's been a side uh, right next to the wall on the high banks of Daytona in a TCR car. And there is a feeling like uh, it is a feeling like no other, but it, the closest you can get is on the iRacing.com service. And uh, just a couple of hours ago, the Fox Sports team, they had a lot of fun with the eNASCAR Pro Invitational, slinging some dirt at the Bristol Motor Speedway and uh, getting some practice for what will be a very interesting weekend of racing action. The first time the cup cars head to the dirt version of Bristol, but we're focusing on Indy cars. Uh, maybe NASCAR could come to Long Beach at some point in the future. That would be an interesting challenge, seeing cars make their way around the final corner. Uh, because, of course, Justin, we we've seen it in other races on the iRacing service. Not necessarily here today. They were very clean coming through that final corner on lap number one. There was some concern from various drivers that things would get checked up. Safety cars might need to be deployed, uh, but with 10 laps to go here, it's been very clean. Uh, drivers really have been fighting the circuit more than each other. As you see, Henry Bennett has dropped down to eighth position now on the left side of your screen. Also seen just there, Tower Graf actually smacked the wall with the left side pod and the left side tires there with a bit of a bobble in that battle going on for 10th position. So everything's kicking off a little bit there, but to get to your point, we were expecting things to be crazy at the start in particular, Arjuna. We've seen that craziness at the start, but as expected, once things spread apart and drivers got into their strategies and thought about big picture and started to break away from one another, that's where things started to calm down a little bit, and that's now where we've seen things break down with nine laps to go to where some drivers have various tire strategies and different stints, some of them in various different compounds here. And this is all played out to be very intriguing, to say the very least, to end off this race. And it's not been the same type of race as we've had at Homestead, but I very much enjoyed it, and it sets the tone 
uh, for the rest of the season because I think in the last four or five races, Justin, we go three road course races back to back to back. And when you think about the championship, uh, if Sage Karam is in the position where he needs three victories to really be challenging Adam Blocker, well, uh, we have to watch out because uh, that, that will be three opportunities for three more victories. Here's that replay, by the way, for Tyler Graf coming through turn number five, slight tap of the wall. He's managing to get away with it, Justin, because you'll see he's still managing to hold off that challenge from behind. Any harder, and he probably loses the right side tires, though. Keep in mind, because drivers have been hitting the wall with that amount of contact and with this damage model, it could potentially cause your tire to have to end up breaking off and rely on the tether. He is locking it up a ton, though. And starting to hold them up a little bit here. Sandman, I think, is a little touch bit quicker. It's just the problem is it's a touch bit quicker. It's not going to get you completely on by. And it's the question mark of can Sandman get close enough to potentially say, you know what, I might risk using a push to pass here to try and get the move done and try and get one more spot, get myself a top 10. Top 10 would be a good result for the Sandman as well. He's made his way up through the field. Up seven on the day. Graf is down three. Uh, he's had rather more of a struggle. Here's a replay, and here's the move, I think, between Lionel Callisto, Henry Bennett. Bennett on the black mark tires, unable to fight it too hard, and a uh, driver, I think, a lot we're expecting fireworks from on the road courses. I think consistency, his aim today, more just focusing on getting to the finish. A top eight here will very much secure him some good championship points comments in our youtube chat by the way racebot's own david haynes jumping in on the fun here justin now, i don't know about you but uh i was never cautious for my own safety i'm cautious i'm more cautious because uh, crashing cars cost my money well in real world in particular it does because i think our producer would in tell max and would say crashing a car costs a lot of money and it's like that with your own street car as well where you you get into a situation, it can cost you thousands of dollars to repair. Add an extra couple zeros to a race car, and that's where the thought process can come in. Well, uh, maybe you could tie in damages to your racing system. That would be an interesting kind of change of pace. Uh, force you to be a little bit more careful. There was a very mm -hmm. interesting article on, I believe it was racer.com in the last few days, comparing uh, the cost of IndyCar back in 1994 to the cost today. Some teams gave some insight to that organization. Some very interesting numbers on the table there. Highly recommend you go take a look because I think the numbers might surprise you. The Sandman, by the way, in that 06 machine, continues to apply the pressure. And I do think five push to passes left to use, Justin. But Graf only has the one to defend there's any mistake from this 26 car a sandman is going to be all over it to take advantage and i think this is a good opportunity to potentially use one of them right here if he can just get a touch a bit more closer really blasting his way on by is using that button just couldn't get enough of a run to really utilize it and he mentioned it as well the use of being able to use them to defend is going to be so critical here and that's why you bank them as well if you run out of them that puts you in a dangerous spot. But here's the thing. The amount you have is also going to depend on or really factor in how many overall attacks you can really theoretically think about, really. Because with five laps to go, you're under five push to passes. You can't go and attack on every single lap. I forget who was saying it recently on a broadcast, but I'm going to steal a line from them. It's not just push to pass, it's push to defend as well. Graft used this final push of the button down that main straightaway the last time around. The Sandman has four more pushes left to go and five laps left to try and make the pass happen. You can see how he sets up the final corner. Graf locks up. That compromises his exit. Can the Sandman get on the button? No, he loses more momentum than Graf lost himself because you saw a little bit too eager, Justin, to get onto the power. He now has to wait for the next lap and one more opportunity. Still plenty of time to regroup here and think about how to play this now. So it just needs to be able to keep into a pro proper rhythm because it's obvious that Graf is struggling right now in the final chicane in particular. That's the tricky part here. On board, we run with the Sandman. Uh, by the way, I'm looking at some of these gaps that are developing. 
Top seven are now one lap down. Ryan Otis will just about in danger of getting lapped before the conclusion of this race. I think we might only have the top five cars that stay on the lead lap come the checkered flag. That illustrates the domination of Sage Karam out front. But this battle will go to the end between the Sandman and Tyler Groff. Impressive runnings as well from Connor Harrington, Brian Carey, and Aaron Morgan here. Justin, we haven't talked too much about them, but they've been very solidly running consistent lap times. Morgan is closing into the back of the Canadian Brian Carey. I bought a couple tenths a lap in particular for that battle. So that's going to potentially be heating up as well. Morgan doing a very impressive job being consistent and being proper through his motions. But falling on board with Tower Graph once more with the Graphics Esports on board. You can see the pressure still being kept up by the Sandman. The Sandman, not necessarily the quickest in an Indy car, but very quick on road courses in general. Lots of experience in the Lotus 79. Finds himself with a couple more laps, a couple more opportunities uh, to find his way into the danger zone and trying to get side by side in towards turn number one. Push to pass being used by the Sandman to try and close that gap back in at this point in time. It's going to be close. I start to wonder now, even though we saw that big contact from Graf a couple of laps ago, Justin, he's picked up the pace quite considerably here, I think, and you can see Connor Harrington coming from behind. He might be trying to get on past fairly quickly. Yeah, that's going to end up, I think, potentially breaking up an opportunity here for the Sandman as... Oh, look, the sun is out as well. This is the brightest it's been all race, Arjuna, in fact. So this is going to be interesting for the end of this race to see how the track reacts to the sunshine. Timing71.org, quick on the button, still saying 33.9 degrees Celsius, so it hasn't changed so much. But we are past 5 p.m. in the virtual California right now. Couple of laps left here on the streets of Long Beach. Sage Karam leads by 14 seconds from defending series champion Adam Blocker. It's been a dominant day for Sage, and with just four miles to go at this point, he's just got to hang on, Justin, and not make any mistakes. What he's been doing, in effect, for the last 60 laps. It's been an unbelievable drive, absolutely, for that two machine, and it's been very difficult to touch him on the road courses so far in 2021, and I think that's gonna be a trend throughout the season, because Karam's quick. Karam showed that last year in the Pro Invitationals for IndyCar, for example, against his fellow competitors. He's shown it in the past in this series and in our series for Lionheart and across iRacing in general. It's going to be tough to stop Sage Karam on a road course. Uh, sorry, I was just a bit distracted from David Haynes in our YouTube chat making some very terrible puns, David, but... uh. He did at least get my attention. Sandman has used all of his push to passes left. He's got no more additional power to make his way past Tyler Graf. It's driver versus driver with two and a half miles left for them. Karam comes across the line to take the white flag and he's 14 seconds clear of Adam Blockers. Connor Harrington, after a very impressive qualifying, Justin, 40 seconds behind your leader. He will finish on the podium, but once again, Ryan Otis, he will stay on the lead lap just about at this point in time, but it has been a very dominant day for Sage Karen. We watched, by the way, a battle between Carey and Morgan that will continue for a subsequent lap after this. And that's how big that gap has gone, right? Is when you're turning 107s on the red tire compound, it has, it's very difficult to try and top that. It's been incredible to say the least, Arjuna. Final couple of corners for Sage Karam. Two race victories in the Lionheart Retro Series already this season. And in his fourth Lionheart competition of the year, he will take victory for the third time here in the HyperX Grand Prix of Long Beach. Because after 64 laps of domination, it's Sage Karam back in HyperX Victory Lane. Very much looking forward to this season now because each of your championship favorites have taken victory in the opening stages of this season and we now head to the short track at Phoenix to continue the championship fight. Battle of the Fourth is not over though. Aaron Morgan, six tenths of a second. Now half a second behind Brian Carey, Justin. A couple of corners left to go here. 
As long as there's no mistakes, though, I think for Carey, he's going to be okay here. Made a little bit of a mistake on that corner entry. Morgan wasn't able to capitalize this. There goes the button. He's on that button, but it's going to be too little, too late. Carey should be able to hold on. Hard breaking zone for the final time. On board, we will stick with the number 48. Can he sneak it down the inside in the final corner? That would be a brave move. I don't think he even thought about it. He will take this fifth place position. And is, I think it's his second top five in Lionheart IndyCar Series competition. Very strong run from Morgan. Carey beats him across the line in fourth. Graf and Sandman, they finish in 10th and 11th respectively. It's been a very fun 64 laps here. And out of the 37 starters, we finish with just under 20 cars taking the checkered flag, Justin. An indication of just how tough this circuit is, but a real effort by these drivers. And for everyone who got to the checkered flag, they will have a well-deserved celebration tonight. Absolutely, with how the pace played out and the difficulty and attrition built in. This was a track we knew that was going to wear out the drivers right from the get-go, and that's exactly what it did throughout the night tonight. What an incredible race. What a credible domination, though, for Sage Karam once more. And on Shoreline Drive, Karam celebrates with Donut once more this season. Let's take a look at our race results brought to us by Carnox, because it is a 15-second dominating victory for Sage Karam here on the streets of Long Beach. Didn't have the most success at the virtual homestead Miami a couple of weeks ago, neither did his teammate, but he rebounds in strong fashion with a new car and a new deal with HyperX as well. Adam Blocker for Adrenaline Power Slide, second podium on the season. He might've been hoping for a little bit more in terms of raw performance. Connor Harrington for Private Label Team Hype. He's the one sole redeeming figure for that team today. But in the team's championship, they will still hold an impressive lead over Adrenaline Motorsports Red. Brian Carey across the line for them in fourth position, holding off Aaron Morgan with a very strong drive for him up into fifth, gaining a number of positions as well. He's up three in today's race. Ryan Otis, last car on the lead lap for Lionheart Retro Series champion. Then Lionel Callisto up nine positions, up into seventh. He passes Henry Bennett in the closing stages of the race. Adam Fraser in ninth. Tyler Graf comes across the line in 10th position. We'll work our way through the next page of results. It's George Sandman in 11th. Uh, Richie Hearn across the line in 12th. Great to see him finishing one lap down. All the way from the back of the field, he's up 22 positions. Samuel Ryman, GSRC's own in 13th. Jason Brophy after qualifying in 20th, recovers to 14th, the race of attrition for Brophy. Uh, Jay Branch, 15th, Matt Houston in 16th, the only car three laps down. Stefan Larkamp, Ricky Harding, they're four laps down. And then Big Joe Hassert and Mike Rigney, 19th and 20th respectively. Scott Holmes across the line in 21st, he's six laps down. Christopher Reagan, 22nd, and then a lot of retirees in today's race. Out of 37 cars, it's 14 of them that don't take to the checkered flag. Luis Gonzalez, Nunes, Chris Fowler, Ron Hacker, Matt Taylor, Brian Beard, Mike Rasmus, George Zaldo, Andrew Kinsella rounds out the top 30. Seven more cars to work our way through in terms of non-finishers. It's James Prahula, the king of chins. A big disappointment for him. A big mistake on lap number eight into turn one. Retires him from the race. Jason Galvin in 33rd. James Paulson in 34th, James Weaver 35th, Dustin Wardlow in 36th, and then Brian Greenlee, our final finisher in 37th position. Let's go back to the streets of Long Beach for the HyperX post-race show because the Lionheart Racing Series is powered by HyperX, makers of premier gaming gear like the legendary ultra-comfortable Cloud line of gaming headsets. Whatever you play, however you play, Hyper HyperX knows we're all gamers. For more information on HyperX products, visit HyperXGaming.com. And don't forget to use promo code Lionheart15, that's L-I-O-N-H-R-T-1-5, for 15% off all orders. Let's work our way into HyperX victory lane and bring in our race winner, Sage Karam, who is standing by with Justin Prince. Yes, indeed, Sage. A very dominating victory today by more than 15 seconds. First things first, Sage, how does it feel to be so dominant today and come away with the inaugural win here at Long Beach in this series? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely feels good. I'm glad it's over with now. It's uh, It was a tough race for sure. You know, this place is uh, 
definitely very difficult to drive. Um, you know, every lap, depending on how big the lead was, was always kind of on the edge. You always had some sort of moment, um, and it's just really easy to screw it up here. Um, and, you know, I, I think with this track being smaller and more technical, um, there was a lot more lap traffic to deal with. So putting that into account, I mean, it was it was hard to manage that. Um, but thankfully, you know, those guys did a great job of, you know, just kind of making it not totally unpredictable. And um, yeah, I mean, it's smooth sailing, you know, no incident points and um, was able just to kind of just do my own thing out there. Of course, on top of things as well, the tire compounds were also a factor in how did that play into how you attacked this race going between the red wall tires and the black and white tires? Yeah, I mean, obviously that's something new for the series this year. Um, I, I mean, it's really cool that we get to do that like we can in real life. So um, the reds are really, really fun to, to drive on. You know, they have a lot of grip. Um, I was really excited when I saw the uh, two cars starting behind us. Um, starting on blacks you know i basically knew that pretty much put them out of the race it's kind of more like for me the way i looked at it was it was more of a mental thing um if you start on reds you know you can stay with the pack and you know attack for position whereas if you start on blacks you know you're just losing spots and then you're pretty much playing catch up the whole race and overdrive and that's when you get in trouble and it seemed like that's what happened so um i knew i just you know wanted to start on reds um and try and control my own fate and uh you know get out to a lead and thankfully that's what we did and then i went to blacks and um you know it didn't really seem all that bad and the tire fall off wasn't all that bad overall between the two so um i have no complaints you know i mean the reds i was able to stay in the sevens the whole 107s the uh, whole stint and the blacks i was low 108 so um it was pretty consistent incredible blistering pace to say the very least and one of the main interesting marks coming up is going to be how things fare up for the next upcoming schedule because Watkins Glen, Watkins Glen is the next road course, but it's short track racing up next. Your thoughts on going over towards Phoenix? Yeah, I mean, Phoenix is always a tough one. Um, Qualifying is pretty big there, um, so going to have to figure that out. You know, I'm his historically not very good at the oval qualifying on the sim here, so um, I'm going to have to figure, figure that out, like I said, and uh, hopefully we can – um, qualify up towards the front and, and kind of control our own fate like we did tonight. So um, I like those types of tracks, the short the short course ovals, just because they're kind of like road courses in a way. You really got to drive them. Um, you know, like one of my favorite tracks in the world is the Milwaukee Mile. So, um, you know, those tracks are, are really fun to drive. Um, but like I said, you know, qualifying is huge, especially in this uh, IR18, you know, and like the DW12, it wasn't as big as an issue. But in these cars, you know, they don't really like dirty air and the tires go off pretty, pretty quickly. Thank you very much for the time, Sage. Congratulations on the victory tonight. Yep. Thank you, guys. Sage Karam, your winner, Arjuna. And dominant victory for Sage as well. Brand new HyperX car. Great to see him enjoying his racing as well. Let's bring in defending series champion Adam Blocker. Adam, interesting race for you there. You had to make a pass down into turn number one because Joshua Chin started on the black mark tires. But after that, Sage kind of ran away with the race. And it was more a race where you couldn't afford to make a mistake because second place, the points are very important. Yeah, I mean, probably the most interesting part of the race for me was the very beginning. I, um, I feel like I could have done a little bit better qualifying lap, but probably not good enough to beat Sage. So um, overall, I was pretty happy with it. And then... Josh, uh, yeah, made going through the hairpin on the pace lap interesting. And then, um, yeah, fortunately, I was able to get him into turn one. I knew that was going to be big. And, um, yeah, once I did, yeah, I was kind of <sighs> – I didn't quite have the pace for Sage. Maybe I was, like, a tenth or two slower. And so I pretty much had to decide whether I was going to push really hard to try to force him into a mistake or just kind of chill because I was pretty confident I had the pace advantage on everyone behind me. And I just kind of took the chill route because it's a long season and I need to finish and just get points the whole season. So, Well, we've talked about this internally as a team, Adam. It's You've won this championship in a number of different ways. You've won it by winning a lot of races, but you won it last year more through sheer consistency and sheer perseverance at times, just finishing in the top five. It, it's a series where, especially this year, when 
the names are so much stronger than I think they've been in the past where you've got you know, likes of rookies like uh, Jason Brophy, Henry Bennett. It does mean that consistent runs, you, you won last time, you got second here today. Uh, it's about as perfect as the start of the season that you really could hope for. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you told me I was going to finish first and second the first two races, I would take it immediately. Um, yeah, I mean, and the other thing is that Long Beach, um, you really have to have a lot of confidence in the car to push. And honestly, just with this setup, um, you know, I had quite a bit of confidence in the first few laps. But once I got on older tires, like I knew how to manage the tires, but I, I couldn't keep up good pace while, um, while fighting that without just having occasional random moments where I would overheat the rears and kind of spin on entry and... Yeah, it's just smarter to, to play the long game and, and sort of just, you know, take the points when you can. Next time we head to a short track for what I think is going to be a very interesting race. Uh, one where we pack on the downforce and uh, maybe sling things around maximum commitment. How excited are you about heading to Phoenix next time out? Normally, Phoenix is one of my best tracks. I really like the short ovals. And I mean, I won there last year. That was one of my two wins. And I think I've gotten polar the last couple of years. So definitely looking forward to it. It's going to be a challenge for me because I'm going to be racing um, not on my own rig. I'm going to be racing in Indianapolis because we're uh, doing the open test in real life. But um, yeah, it's going to be an interesting challenge. But definitely um, looking forward to Phoenix. The race is really great. You can pass high line, low line in three and four. And, you know, it, it's just one of my favorite tracks. So I'm um, definitely looking forward to it. And yeah, I just want to thank the team um, for the result or, you know, for the effort. Thank uh, or congratulate Brian on a good drive for fourth and Henry at P8. And yeah, just want to, I'll see you guys next time, I guess. See you next time indeed on his quest for a fourth consecutive Lionheart IndyCar Series champion. Almost perfect here to start off his campaign. Third and final podium interview to get to, and it's Connor Harrington, driver for private label Team Hype, a highest place representative for that outfit as well. And he's standing by with Justin Prince. Very quiet day for you in third position, 42.7 seconds back, yes, but a podium finish, Connor. First of all, how are you feeling about the strong run today to be able to hold on to third basically the entire night today? Yeah, our uh, our private label uh, Esca clothing uh, machine was really good tonight. Um, I don't think we really had the pace to um, to try to hang with, with uh, Sage or Adam. So we tried a little um, alternate strategy to start by running the hard tire. Um, and uh, we were able to thankfully survive the uh, the first stint on the hards there and then be able to go to the soft and, and open up the gap to make it a, um, a, comfy, uh, a comfy third place finish for us tonight. What makes this track so difficult, in your opinion? Because it caught several drivers out as well tonight, including your fellow teammate, Joshua Chin, on this strategy. Yeah, I don't know. It, it, it's, uh, I think the tough part about it is just it's the bumps, really. Um, the, you know, the walls are obviously unforgiving, but the, the bumps uh, really make it difficult to get the car um, to not lock the brakes or, or slide the tires under braking. And, um, so you really had to uh, to pick a line that was smoother than others and kind of hopefully get lucky that you don't hit the bumps. Unfortunately, Josh got caught out. Um, I think Josh actually probably had better pace than I had tonight. So if, if he had made it past that first day, I think he could have actually challenged Adam. Um, so that's a shame for, for us. But a good points night for us. Um, Jason with a, a, a solid uh, top 15 finish. Um, I don't know exactly what the points are, but we had a, an okay points night. Um, so I think we still are in the lead, which is, uh, which is great for our uh, private label team hype. Next race over at Phoenix, your thoughts on going short track racing? Uh, yeah, the, the, the short track package will be interesting. Um, I love it. I love the short track uh, package. Uh, Jason is really, really good at it. Um, and so is Chin. So I hope uh, we can have a repeat performance, uh, from our homestead result, and uh, maybe get the, uh, the top step of the podium uh, next week. Thank you very much for your time, Connor. Thank you, guys. Have a great evening. So final interview. Coming away final with third part in. Sorry, no, Justin. That was my fault. Final interview done, and uh, very interesting comments there. I think all three drivers, Justin, looking forward to the short track that's up next, and I am too. You could hear Adam Blocker. He says it's one of his favorite tracks, and after the way he started his run to another championship, potentially, I can tell why he's excited. And you already mentioned that that split schedule that we were talking about during the race, having to share a rig with someone else, it's going to be a factor in race number three.
especially with trying to adjust to the rig, having time to set up on the rig, etc. That's all going to be vital to make sure he gets a proper run, to say the very least, Arjuna, at the next track. It's going to be tricky, to say the very least. One more look at the schedule here. It's a couple of races in April, a couple of races in May, and then we start to get busy. Three races in June, and more importantly, I did mention at the uh, midway through the race, it's not three consecutive road courses that we'll have to finish off the season, but it will be Road America Belle Isle, a two of the final rounds, Belle Isle being the penultimate one. So a Karim dominant on the streets of Long Beach. Can he be dominant on the streets of Detroit as well? Going to be interesting, nevertheless. The Lionheart Indy Car Series, always fun to talk about. A couple of thank yous to get to as well, because there's a big team behind the Lionheart Indy Car Series, and it all starts with the names up on your screen. You can head over to the LionheartRacingSeries.com website to learn more about them, but we've got some thank yous to get to as well. First up, it's Butt Kicker. For sim racers, the Butt Kicker Gamer 2 or Simulation Kit as the missing driver to car connection bringing more realism to your sessions. By accurately responding to in-game audio, you can feel the track like never before, providing increased vehicle handling and faster lap times. Are you ready for the most immersive experience in sim racing? For more information, visit thebuttkicker.com and don't forget to use promo code LION2021 for 20% off all orders. The Lionheart Racing Series is powered by HyperX, makers of premier gaming gear like the legendary Ultra Comfortable cloud line of gaming headsets. Whatever you play, however you play, HyperX knows we're all gamers. For more information on HyperX products, visit HyperXGaming.com and don't forget to use promo code LIONHEART15, that's L-I-O-N-H-R-T-1-5, for 15% off all orders. Minus 273 is premier name in carding gloves. Their industry lean gloves are super lightweight and durable, made of breathable poly spandex. Whether you're a Carter Sim Racer, Minus 273 gives you the control to reach victory lane. For more information on Minus 273's full line of gloves and apparel, visit minus273.biz. Don't forget to also use Minus 273 LHRS 15 for 15% off orders. Looking for entertaining sim racing content? Look no further than the DMLC Racing Channel. Follow former Lionheart Retro Series Driver of the Year Mark Cohn's racing escapades as he battles for wins and avoids wrecks with cat-like reflexes, all while providing commentary sure to make you laugh, cry, or both. Follow along by subscribing to the DMLC Racing Channel on YouTube and like his Facebook page at the DMLC Racing Channel. The Sim Experience AccuForce Pro V2 system is the premier professional simulator racing steering system. The key to its incredible realism is the groundbreaking direct drive motor control system, providing a drop in experience that's second only to the real thing. For more information on the entire Sim Experience ecosystem, visit simexperience.com. And again, you can visit the Lionheart Racing Series website to learn more about all of the Lionheart partners and the people that make this series happen. It's time to say goodbye though, to follow all of us for more esports action. Stay involved on social media, at Lionheart Series, to stay involved with all three Lionheart competitions on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. If you want to stay involved with us at RaceBot TV and all the great sim racing series we get to cover, subscribe to us on YouTube, hit the bell next to it as well to get notified every single time we go live with the great sim racing series we get to cover. Two rounds are done with each of the Lionheart competitions, and it's 